Halloween, a holiday where kids go out in their costumes and can be whatever they want while collecting candy. This is supposed to be a fun night, however, that was not the case for nine-year-old Lisa Ann French. On Halloween night in 1973, Lisa would go trick-or-treating and she would only make it to three houses she would become a victim of the Halloween killer. Lisa's body would be found a few days later after a massive search was underway by authorities and the entire community. This case broke the hearts of not only Lisa's parents, but the citizens of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. It would take nine months to finally find the person who murdered Lisa. However, the justice system has failed Lisa many times by letting her murderer walk free after going back and forth to prison. Decades later, he is currently awaiting yet another trial that will start this month, two days before the 47th anniversary of her murder. This is the case of a nine-year-old girl who had her innocence and life taken from her by someone she knew. This is the case of Lisa Ann French. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hi my name is Monica. I like to post anti MLM life and some true crime content here on this channel. So if any of that interests you, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I would love for you to stick around. In today's video, we are going to be discussing some true crime content. So I will be issuing a disclaimer and a trigger warning. Warning, the following presentation is intended for mature audiences. It contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes, adult dialogue, and adult language. Viewer discretion is advised. The trigger warning that I'm going to issue today is regarding sexual assault uh, and the murder of a child. So this is a case that is a little bit heavier than what I've covered here on my channel before. I mean, I've covered some pretty intense cases, but whenever there's a child involved, I feel as though it's... A little more it's just heavier than than usual content and also of course always do your own research because I will leave all of my sources linked below but there was some conflicting information that I was finding in multiple different articles so I just wanted to say that this is allegedly please do your own research anyway this video is going to be the first video of my spooktober series and you'll be getting one of these videos. I'm hoping to have it every Friday of the month. As of right now, I'm planning to have one every single Friday of the month of October because it, this is my favorite month of the year. Halloween is my favorite holiday of all time. Yes, I'm one of those crazy people who had their Halloween decorations up all over the house in August. So <laughs> basically what I'm trying to say is that I'm a huge fan of the month of October and also Halloween in general. Today we're going to be talking about the horrific case of Lisa French, who was a nine-year-old little girl who was murdered on Halloween night in 1973 in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. This murder had the entire town looking for Lisa on the night of Halloween and the days following. And her killer would be dubbed the Halloween Killer. Not only did this case bring an entire town together to make sure that they could get justice for Lisa, and trust me, this fight would be over the span of decades. So this community was just very invested in getting justice for Lisa. But this case shook this town to its core. In 2013, there was a reporter by the name of Terry Sater who was able to track down the lead detective on the case who was Detective Melvin Heller. And Detective Heller said, quote, it was terrible what he did to that little girl. It isn't the same here in Fond du Lac. Everybody that lives here always knows about Lisa French. From what I was reading in a lot of articles that I found, a lot of people share Lisa's story every Halloween just to bring awareness that people like this, monsters like the Halloween killer, exist everywhere. They're not just random strangers, they're people that you may even know. Let's just get right into this video. So on Halloween night of 1973, there was an adorable nine-year-old girl named Lisa Ann French. And she was just like any other child on Halloween night who was excited to go trick-or-treating and to wear her costume. 
As I said earlier, this happened in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and Lisa wanted to wear a butterfly costume. However, her mother Marianne wanted her to wear something a bit warmer due to the weather. My mom was actually like this growing up as well. Anytime that I wanted to dress up, more times than not, my mom did have to alter the costume because either one, she would make my costumes, or two, if there was a costume that had a little bit thinner material, she would change it so that it was warmer because if, in case you don't know if you're new here, I grew up in New Jersey. So it can get really cold during Halloween, especially because the one year it actually snowed on Halloween. So that's just something I wanted to add in there that, I mean, my mom did this too. Lisa's mother, Marianne, would help her put together a last minute costume. And according to a lot of articles that I read, it was a hobo costume. And because Marianne was a cosmetologist, she painted little freckles on little nine-year-old Lisa's face. Lisa would be super excited, obviously, as any kid is on Halloween night to go trick-or-treating. She would be super excited and she wanted to eat dinner as fast as possible so that she can go off and go trick-or-treating. The original plan was for Lisa and her friend to go to a place called Pumpkin Place which was something that the parents put together for the children to have a safe place to trick or treat at because at the time, and we, this isn't anything new, we hear this all the time, this pops up all the time during Halloween, but there was talk that there was some kind of a specific candy that had some kind of poison in it. So these parents wanted to have a safe place for them to trick or treat and have candy that they know is not going to be poisoned. And as I said, we see this all the time. I think just last year, I saw an article saying that people were handing out edibles to children, which in my opinion, now I may be wrong, but in my opinion, I highly doubt that anyone is going to give out their edibles to children. Those plans to go to Pumpkin Place, unfortunately would change because I've seen different articles, but I've seen where it said that Lisa had gotten in trouble, then there was another one that said her friend got into trouble, but judging by the fact that she had a curfew and everything, and judging by the fact that a lot more articles said that Lisa had gotten in trouble, I'm just going to just theorize that it was probably Lisa. But because of this, they were not allowed to go to Pumpkin Place together. And that didn't stop Lisa though. She decided that she was going to go trick-or-treating alone. She was just going to go into the neighborhood, a couple of houses here and there. And of course her mom said that she had to be back by 7 p.m. That was her curfew. And she left at 6 p.m. to go trick-or-treating. And it would later be discovered that she only made it to three houses that night. The first house was that of a teacher. The second house was that of a classmate of hers. And the third house was Gerald Turner's house, who at the time seemed harmless because he actually knew Lisa's family and Lisa was, she knew him as well. So it wasn't one of those stranger danger type situations. But when 7 p.m. rolled around, Lisa was still not home. And so her mother just started to think that maybe it's because she's just trying to push her curfew a little bit. I've done this plenty of times in the past. But then Marianne realized that something was wrong. Lisa's mom would end up calling authorities and a search would go underway. And it was said that parents in the neighborhood were very close and the PTA had something called block parents. And the head of the block parents called about 50 other block parents to let them know that Lisa's missing. And by 10 p.m., the entire neighborhood was out there looking for Lisa. They even started putting signs in their windows that the night that Lisa went missing, saying that they're looking for her. If you see her, let us know, call somebody, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the search party would be conducted by both the police all night and then by the community. The following day after Halloween, there were over 5,000 people that were out looking for nine-year-old Lisa French. And by this point, they had widened the search a little bit past the, the community, just, just in case maybe she was out there somewhere in the world. So they had widened the search. But along with that, they had, obviously they had police and the people in the community looking for Lisa, but they even called the National Guard to come in and help them with this search. 
In addition to that, there were some people who had private planes who volunteered and said that they would fly above and see if maybe they could find something, vehicles that could get into the terrain of something like bodies of water, marshes, fields, woods, anything. They were just all out there looking for Lisa. So in other words, there was a massive search going underway. A local Photoshop decided to print out 6,000 copies of Lisa's photo along with the description of what she was wearing that night for her Halloween costume. And that was being passed around everywhere. Along with that, gas stations started to chip in by telling people that they're going to give away 25 gallons of gas to anyone who's using their car to look for Lisa. Eventually, Lisa's body would be found just a few short days after she went missing on Halloween night. A farmer was out on his tractor going around the property when he found two random garbage bags just, just sitting there. And of course, he stopped and he opened them up to see what was in these bags. And there was Lisa's lifeless body and then the other bag had her personal belongings in it. Someone had discarded her like as if she was trash. They just threw her into some random field and just left her there as if she didn't matter to anybody in the world. What kind of monster would do something like that to a nine-year-old girl. It was said that people of the community had gotten to Lisa's body even before police did. There was a pastor who climbed through a barbed wire fence, and even though he got cut everywhere, he still ran over to Lisa's body and started praying over her body. Finding Lisa's body broke the hearts of everyone in that community because they were all out there looking for her. The entire community came to mourn the family's loss at the funeral on November 6th of 1973 to show their support. And when I say the entire community, I, I, I mean the entire community. The building was jam-packed with people. There were nine rows that were taken up just by her Girl Scouts and her classmates. Just, and it was nine rows of people, so just imagine how many more people were in that building. There was an article that I found that said, Lisa's mother, Marianne, found some kind of notes that were in one of Lisa's Bibles, and it was the day after the funeral. One of the notes read, quote, if you ask Jesus to take over, you will begin a new life, end quote. There was another one that said, quote, smile, God loves you, end quote. Gerald Miles Turner Jr. had been questioned the day after Lisa had been reported missing, just as a standard questioning since he lived a few houses down from Lisa's home and they were interviewing everyone in that area. However, investigators would believe by process of elimination that the third and final house Lisa had gone to was Gerald's and that that was the last time that she was seen. Of course, Gerald would go on to deny having any kind of involvement in the murder of Lisa French, but after nine months, he finally confessed to the murder of Lisa. And this was on August 8th of 1974 that Gerald confessed to the murder. His story would change a lot during the trial, which would in turn end in him saying that he only confessed so that the police would stop bringing him in for questioning and stop harassing him and that he was completely innocent in this whole entire case. But that was obviously not true. Gerald knew Lisa prior to luring her into his home. He used to share a duplex with Lisa's family. So of course, inviting her into his home wasn't strange. And for her, it, as I said earlier in the video, it wasn't considered stranger danger to her because she knew him very well. And when he used to live next door to the family, she loved talking to him. So she didn't think that he had any kind of ill intent for inviting her into his home. But on that Halloween night of 1973, after he would invite her inside of the home, he would pull her into the bedroom and this is where he would sexually assault Lisa. He told investigators that at one point he had realized that she had stopped breathing. 
and he did try to resuscitate her. However, his girlfriend came home and interrupted him in this process of trying to resuscitate Lisa. When his girlfriend did come home, she had no idea what had happened. So she didn't know that Lisa was, was in the house or in the bedroom. And Gerald put socks on his hands and moved Lisa's body to the master bathroom. He walked out of the room wrapped in a bathrobe and told his girlfriend that he wasn't feeling well. What was a little strange to his girlfriend was that while she was there, she noticed that he kept on going back to the, to the bedroom. And she didn't really dig too deep into it because she didn't really think that anything was really that wrong. So she left the home and went to her mother's house. Once Gerald's girlfriend left the house to go to her mother's, he put Lisa's body in a garbage bag and her belongings in a second garbage bag. Gerald drove out a few miles past the town and that would be where he would dump Lisa's body and her belongings into that field that that farmer on the tractor would eventually find a few days later. It would become known by the medical examiner that Lisa's cause of death was asphyxiation. However, it was not by smothering or by strangulation. Lisa French had died of shock while she was being sexually assaulted. When I read this and when I saw that that was the cause of death, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know that that was possible. I honestly, I didn't even think that that was possible, but it was in this case. Before we proceed, I did just wanna mention something because of course, Gerald would be arrested and he would go to trial. But during this trial, there were women who testified against him saying that he forced himself onto them as well. If they wouldn't have sex with him, he didn't take no for an answer. These women who testified included a 15 year old babysitter, a former wife and a former girlfriend. The jury found Gerald Miles Turner Jr. guilty of second degree murder, enticing a child for immoral purposes and acts of sexual perversion. He was sentenced to 36 years and six months in prison. And on February 3rd of 1975, he started serving his prison time. There was an article that I read that had a psychologist by the name of Robert Owens who met with Gerald. And he said, quote, he has a cold disregard for people, mainly females. He does not have conscious control to inhibit his impulses for pleasure and to conform to society's laws, end quote. The circuit court judge Milton would go on to say that during the trial, there was no sign of remorse coming from Gerald. He just, it didn't look like it phased him at all what he had done. And in 1992, Gerald had only served 17 years of his sentence for the murder of Lisa French, and he was able to get out on parole for good behavior. He would end up living in a halfway house in Milwaukee. And as to be expected, a lot of people were absolutely outraged that he got out of prison and that he was free to just roam the streets. I mean, how could you put someone like that back on the streets? And it doesn't end there. Keep watching this video because it, it, it just gets worse. It just gets worse from here. And this is when the citizens of Fond du Lac started a civil lawsuit in November of 1993 for allowing Gerald to be released on parole. And the citizens stated that there was an error in how the state calculated his release date. Because of this, the state did admit to making an error and they brought Gerald back to prison. After that, they set his release date to be in July of 1994. The state had decided that in 1994, they would admit him into a psychiatric hospital. And this was because of the law that they had created. A petition in state law could prevent him from getting out yet again. And that is of Wisconsin chapter 980, which is also referred to as Turner Law. Yes. This law was named after Gerald Turner, and it was named after him in 1992 when he was first 
paroled. And that's when they came up with this law and they had to pass it and everything like that. And I will leave it linked below because it is a very lengthy law, but to give you the, the short and simplified version, it's basically a law where sex offenders could be secured at a psychiatric hospital once they are up for parole, if it is believed that they are still a threat to society or a sexually violent person, or if they, if people, you know, experts and stuff say that they will reoffend or that it's a possibility that they can reoffend. And the Department of Justice wanted to keep Gerald committed to an institution as a sexually violent person. However, the nightmare would not end there. In 1998, Gerald went to court again. His argument was that he had a right to his freedom and that he was not a sexual predator, nor should he be in a psychiatric hospital. Once the jury deliberated, they agreed to let him out yet again. And they said that they determined he was not a sexual predator. If this doesn't have your blood boiling, that then I just, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's this, when I was reading this, it just really had my blood boiling. But let's continue. Then after this, apparently in July of 1998, he threatened a caseworker with a knife. And at this point, they requested to revoke his parole. And for whatever reason, the judge decided that he was free to go. So you have someone who sexually assaulted women, including children, and he threatened a caseworker with a knife. But he's not a threat to society and he's free to go. Okay, because that makes so much sense. That makes so much sense. The justice system failed so many people with this man for so many years. But... Anyway, let's keep going. To make matters even more interesting and to anger you even more, Gerald filed a lawsuit in 1999 against a company that he thought he didn't get hired for because of his prior conviction. And he won. Yeah, he won. But there was a law in place at, in the state at the time that said you couldn't base hiring someone or not hiring someone based on a prior conviction. So I think that's how he was kind of able to get around it and that's how he was able to win. He would live at yet another halfway house, but they would find that he violated his parole again. They did routine checks on his computer and they found that in 2003, his computer was filled with sexually explicit videos. He even watched movies about serial killers and one of them included a little girl being murdered. Because he was a registered sex offender, this of course violated his parole and the state sent him back to prison for another 15 years. But Gerald had a mandatory release date of February 1st, 2018. This in turn outraged Lisa's family and both her family and the Wisconsin Department of Justice were not about to let this happen again. They were not allowed, they were not about to allow this man to walk free again. In October of 2017, Lisa's mom started her own petition along with the Wisconsin Department of Justice to hold him under Turner's law. In April of 2018, a judge in Fond du Lac agreed to move his case to Dane County, which is where Gerald had lived at the time. This was also because Gerald and his lawyers were making the argument that there could be a possible bias in Fond du Lac and that he was afraid he wouldn't get a fair trial. This was also in addition to his parole violation because that was the most current crime that he had committed and that happened in Dane County. He would at one point be released from the correctional institution and Gerald would live at Mouston's Sand Ridge Secure Treatment Center. 
This treatment center is run by the Department of Health Services and the state's Sexually Violent Persons Program. Eventually, an appeals judge ruled that the case can move forward in Fond du Lac Court. In 2019, he was considered for parole again. And an article that I read that was published on May 15th of 2020 of, of this year provided even more news about all of this. Somehow, Gerald Turner was granted a court hearing and the court hearing is set for two days before the 47th anniversary of when he sexually assaulted and killed nine-year-old Lisa French. This Halloween will be the 47th anniversary of what he did to Lisa. A Fond du Lac County judge will hear arguments on October 29th of this year of 2020 and decide whether or not Gerald will be able to roam the streets yet again or if he will have to stay at this psychiatric hospital for the rest of his life. In my opinion, I hope that he is secured in this place and I hope that he stays at this psychiatric hospital and that he's not allowed to roam the streets again because, I mean, some people are have been arguing that it's because of his age and stuff like that, but I mean, I don't think that it matters how old someone is. If they committed a crime, they need to do the time for it. I mean, this isn't just, you know, he had a warrant out for his arrest for a parking ticket or something. This is, he murdered a nine-year-old girl and sexually assaulted her. This isn't just some little violation. And so I think that the family of Lisa, along with the citizens of Fond du Lac, who have been very, very invested in this case, I think that, I mean, that town and that family has gone through so much that I feel like it would just be a kick to the gut to see their daughter's murderer walk free after fighting for decades to keep him locked up somewhere. And I don't think he should walk free. Lisa trusted him and he stole her innocence along with her life and he ended her life. I don't think that a monster like that should be allowed to have any kind of freedom. I think that he should be locked up for the rest of his life. That's just my opinion. Your opinion may differ. <clears throat> but his lawyers are fighting back. And even though y'all already know my opinion about this, uh, his lawyers have something to say about Turner's, Turner's law and what they think of him being categorized as a sexually violent person. So his lawyers, Robert Peterson and Evan White, they filed two motions to dismiss the case. And this is because they say that there is a lack of sufficiency in this, in this petition. They also argue that he doesn't fit the criteria of any sense of the category of being a sexually violent person. His lawyer stated that in order to be deemed a sexually violent person, the criteria are as follows. Been convicted of a sexually violent offense, found delinquent for a sexually violent offense, found not guilty of a sexually violent offense by reason of mental disease or defect, have a mental disorder or be dangerous to others because the person's mental disorder makes it likely that he or she will engage in acts of sexual violence. And of course, they brought in experts to see if Gerald fits into any of these categories. And what they found was that one department of corrections doctor said that Gerald did not have a qualifying mental illness and was not more than likely to not commit a future act of sexual violence. Another psychologist could not conclude if he was more than likely than not to offend. 
The state could not support that due to a mental disorder, Gerald was more likely than not to offend. However, in response, Assistant Attorney General Deborah Ayala did argue that the state did support its claim. And this is because Gerald had been convicted of one count of sexual morality, one count of indecent liberties with a child under the age of 16, one count of abnormal sexual perversion, and a count of second degree murder, which are deemed sexually violent crimes. Thank you to the Assistant Attorney General for having some kind of common sense, because apparently nobody else has any kind of common sense and they're trying to argue that he's not a sexually violent person. There was a psychologist that found Gerald suffered from other specified paraphilic disorder and pedophilic disorder. So in my opinion, in other words, he's a and a monster. This means that both conditions can affect his emotional capacity and can cause him to engage in sexually violent acts. On top of all of this, there was another doctor that did an assessment on him stating that there is a 19.1% likelihood of him reoffending. And she used an assessment by the name of static 99R, but also said that it may not accurately measure this. The assessment could also not take into account that Gerald had stated previously in 2002 that he had 10 juvenile victims and 14 adult victims throughout his life. However, with all of this, the state believes the petition along with everything that I just talked about could be enough to establish probable cause. I will be looking at this and I will be watching it to make sure that he does stay behind bars. I mean, I, I mean, not behind bars, but in the psychiatric hospital, I really truly hope that the justice system does not fail Lisa again. And I hope that they can finally put him where he belongs and let him sit there for the rest of his life. And I just, I, I, I can't believe how many times he was able to get out and how many times he was able to beat the system, so to speak. So you guys let me know what you think in the comment section below. I always love to hear your guys' comments, your theories, and yeah, just let me know what you think of this case. Or even if you want to further the discussion and if you maybe want to theorize on whether or not he's going to be able to walk free, then yeah, leave that in the comment section below. I would love to hear your guys' opinions. And anyway, that is all that I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. And this is Monica reporting to you live from a highway. Bye.